thank you very much, uh, Tim, for that amazing introduction. Um, and actually, before we start, I just wanted to say a personal thank you to Tim and Joe and the team uh, from, from us, from our team. Uh, we are so grateful that you choose to fund us. And, uh, and actually, it's, it's you that, that, that fund it as well, because you are the clients. So you might not know that you are funding our painted dogs, but you are. So we need you to spend more with Tim. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. You can yeah. see why <laughs> <laughs> just keep, just keep spending. Um, so yes, we are the David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation. We are a very small team based in Shelford. There are twelve of us. Georgia is our individual giving fundraiser, and uh, Lewis is along for the ride today and to eat the delicious food. Um, today, I just wanted to talk to you specifically about the project that you're spending funds. Uh, but before we do that, I want to just remind you of, of why our foundation exists. Many of you would have heard of David Shepherd. Simon, you hadn't. Uh, David Shepherd is a, was a prolific, of his time, a prolific wildlife artist, uh, extremely <coughs> talented. In fact, when he was a teenager, he tried to apply to the art college and was told that he had absolutely no talent whatsoever um, and sent away, sent away packing. So he travelled to Africa. Whilst he was in Africa, he saw some very distressing sites. Um, for example, he saw 255 zebras killed at a water hole through poisoning um, and, and uh, elephants that had been killed. And this is going back into the 60s and 70s. And he decided that even if he was considered to be talentless, he would use the talent that he did have to save the wildlife. And he proceeded, he came back to the UK and... and uh, uh, proceeded to raise money from the work that he did do to plough back into conservation in Africa. And to date, uh, he, his work has produced nearly eight million pounds worth of funding that gets sent you know, back to the projects, which is incredible considering he had no talent. <laughs> he's, uh, he's our founder and our president. He's 85 now. Um, uh, but still a very much part of <coughs> what we do. His daughter is our chairman. His granddaughter is our policies and projects manager. Uh, his other daughter is a, a prolific painter and sells her work for wildlife. And his other granddaughter does the same. So we're really lucky as a very small charity to have that heritage and we're, we're really proud of that. Uh, just very briefly, this is what we do. Uh, we fight wildlife crime and we really do punch above our weight. We are involved at all levels of policy right up, and up until uh, uh, number 10 Downing Street. We, we are represented at all levels of CITES, which is the organisation that decides how international trade um, is, is done and, and which animals can be traded and which ones can't. And our team are right up there with Born Free and task and all of the big international so you know for our little team of 12 we're really proud and again that's something that all of you are part of um, and so for those of you that don't know the wild dog this is this is who you fund we had a chat today about the fact that probably uh, it's a face that only conservationists really love um, they're not they're not an especially endearing uh, species uh, but they are incredibly endangered and it's a species that we choose to fund because nobody else really focuses on them. You know, there, there are iconic species, rhinos and elephants, which raise huge amounts of money. These are the species that get left behind and these are the type of species that we focus on, really endangered species that don't always hit the headlines. Uh, this word, Iangania, is the Indabella word for painted dogs. So because I'm Zimbabwean, that's my... Little bit of Zimbabwe in there. Uh, and this is the project <coughs> that we fund through uh, what we get from Tim and from you. Uh, it's called Painted Dogs Conservation. We've been funding them since 1995. The populations is interesting, and to put this into context, at the turn of the 19th century, there were 500,000 painted dogs. In 1987, there were 450 known in the species, <coughs> and by 2008, 750, and now, you know, they are stabilising, but still hugely endangered because 
uh, what's happening now is that uh, habitat fragmentation, you know, the communities are growing bigger, there's less and less space for the dogs to roam, and dogs need, you know, hundreds of miles, they, they run hundreds of miles in a week, and of course there's no space now for them as the communities are <coughs> growing. Since we funded, and because we specifically look at anti-poaching and uh, wildlife crime, uh, 30,000 snares have been removed, which, which is a really huge deal. Um, and we cover, I couldn't say, for you techie guys, I couldn't work out how to get the square. <laughs> so if someone could show me that, Simon, <laughs> that would be very good for my next presentation. Um, it's a huge, it's a huge <coughs> amount, it's a huge area to fund. Um, and a very tiny team, so the PDC team is, as well are very small. But as you can see, that's an incredible result. So we know that where we fund projects, we make a real difference. Um, and for us, that's what keeps us going. Even if it's not the big sexy projects, it keeps us inspired. Um, has anybody been to Zimbabwe? Aha, Joe and the gentleman at the back. So this, this is Zimbabwe. Um, and this is Wangi National Park here, and PDC is based just on the edge of the national park. So, in, in fact, my colleague Georgia was there very recently, so she knows she should be doing this, actually. Um, so that just puts the country... And, and just bear in mind, the UK geographically fits three times into Zimbabwe. So it just gives you an idea of the scale of the country and the scale of you know, what we're trying to achieve. And these are the babies. So the thing that's really interesting about painted dogs is that um, the packs are so intrinsically linked and so uh, powerful. The, the community of a pack is so interesting. The, the packs range between 20 and 30 in a pack. There are two alphas in a pack. One is a male and one is a female. And they are the only two that will ever breed in a pack. Uh, the aunties and uncles never breed the aunties and uncles babysit. And just those two alphas are the ones that breed. And if one of them is lost, the impact on the pack is devastating. Virtually the whole pack is lost. So uh, that just shows you how critical it is, you know, how each animal is so important. <coughs> the other thing that's interesting is that they are very efficient killers. Um, they have a success rate of about 80% on a kill. They pack, uh, they, w when they kill, they run in large packs and they take turns, so it's, it's, it's quite sophisticated. They, they can outrun any animal because they understand that actually they don't have to be running at 100 miles an hour all the time. Their aunts and uncles will come and, and take over the run and, ch and, and chase down the kill and the others then fall back and have a rest. So it means that between them communicating and thinking about how they're going to kill, they never run out of steam. It's a really interesting thing, isn't it? That they have that intelligence to work together. Uh, so, and as a result, they have an 80% success rate on a kill, which is really unheard of compared to other prey species. Um, interestingly, they then sadly lose 50% of that 80% to other predators. So, yes, I wondered how that fitted into the IT world. <laughs> um, <laughs> Probably the same. So uh, they're very, they are really an incredible species, um, but very pack dependent. And that's really why they're so vulnerable, because if you lose just one of those two, the, the pack is pretty much lost. So it's, it's very important that we look after those. The work that we specifically fund, um, and which you specifically fund, is anti poaching patrols. You can see, Georgia, you probably know the, the chap's name Washington. Washington. Um, we use radio transmitter collars, uh, so not the most sophisticated. They cost about $300. Um, of course, we would aspire to GPS collars, and that's something that's very much on our radar. Uh, but they cost about $5,000 each. Um, so, of course, we have to balance the amount of money that we can fund um, against specific things like collars. This is the collars, uh, the type of collar that we fund at the moment, and they're very interesting. They have sort of um, fluorescent um, colouring around the edge so that at night they're seen when, when traffic comes through the National Park. And they also have these spikes on them, which means they can't be caught up in snares. So they are, you know, they're very simple but very effective collars. And you can see he's just wearing one now. 
And these guys literally drive around. Their job is to follow the packs and follow the, the, the radio transmitters just to check where they are. Often it's, it's so that if they are heading towards a, a community and you know there's going to be a, a row and they could take a, a cow or a, a goat, um, these guys can head them off. So that is their job. It's, it sounds incredibly simple, but it's so, so important. Um, we also, at the, at the centre, unfortunately there are situations where uh, dogs are found and rescued and then they have to be kept. They, they can't possibly be put back into the wild. This dog here is called John and I gather John was deserted in a den and um, in the efforts to get John out of the den, um, the spades that were, be were being used to dig him out unfortunately cut through his back. So he's, he's virtually um, disabled and not able to ever be released back into the wild and he's very old now. And this is Roman who I believe was taken on and reared, hand reared and therefore you ruin any chance of ever going back into the wild. So these two are kept at the centre as um, ambassadors, uh, species ambassadors to teach the kids about the animals. So at least, you know, they have a really important function in life. This is the lab on site. Um, primarily they research, they, they look at the stools that they find and, and from that they're able to tell all sorts of things in terms of parasites and uh, also analyse the hair that's, that's in the stool so they can see what the, the dogs have been eating. So yeah, that's very important from a data point of view. Uh, so a massive part of the work, as you know, 30,000 snares uh, have been collected in the time that we've been funding. Um, it's a big, it's, it's probably the single biggest job that they have to do out there. This is the, the centre, the visitor centre, and what they've done is they've used all of the snare wire that they've collected from, you know, the years of funding to hold up the building. So that's, so that's really, around that is packed the mud of the building. And I really love that, that they've used something really awful to create something educational and good. Um, so there's no waste. They also use the snare wire to create <coughs> snare art, which they then sell on to the visitors to the centre. Um, and I'm really sorry, I had brought all of that to show you, and I left it at work. So, um, yeah, it's a shame, because actually the snare itself that I had <coughs> wanted to show you was a buffalo snare, and it's really grim and you have to see it to believe it. Um, so th probably the most important and sustainable part of the project is the education with the local community and one of the things that this project does is that they truly engage. So we know that projects often pay lip service to community engagement. This project really does. Uh, they run AIDS clinics, they have this bush camp for children uh, where 30 children come at a time, often children who have never seen electricity, never slept in a bed, um, who live alongside the wild animals and yet are pretty disregarded in that, in that effect. So this is a really important piece of work. And this, we probably won't start to see the benefits for another 20 years. Um, you know, these are the guys that will decide in 20 years' time that we're not going to do this anymore. And uh, for me, this is probably the best part of the project. There's some fantastic stories that have come out of it. There was a, a goat that was killed by a grandfather by a wild dog quite recently, actually about three months ago. And when PDC went to apologise to the goat owner, he <coughs> said, uh, actually I only had three goats and your dogs took one of them. But I think that's okay because I can see what you're doing for our children and I can see what you do for our community and I can see the benefits. So that's, then you start to think, actually, we, we are, we're winning that war. Um, and as it happens, the, the, the man's grandson then applied for a job quite recently uh, in the offices at PDC and completely unqualified. Um, and there was another candidate who was completely qualified from uh, the city, Bulawayo. And PDC had to take on the local kid. There was no question, even though he had no qualifications, because it's so much more than that. It's about the long term.
and that's it. So again, I can't thank <coughs> you enough. Our team can't thank you enough. Uh, really, this, this happens because uh, you spend your money with Tim. So <laughs> 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 thank you very much. <laughs>